So that Rampart is blocking, and so now it cannot be used for this Rift Bind. So the Rampart did absorb a little bit of that damage, but we're at 23 to 23 here as far as I know. And this Rift Bind's coming in for another five. Yeah, solid turn from Cody. I'm going to make a rule for us, Tannen. If we're talking about the combat chain, when chain is around, we have to say combat chain. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get better about that. Okay. I, 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 did, I did too. I didn't think of it. But when you're just saying chain all the time, it could definitely get confusing. Mm -hmm. Very important that chain, the hero, effectively manages the combat chain. And I know they recently had some kind of uh, rule change and terminology change. Is it so, what exactly, are they calling this the stack now too as well? Yes, that has changed with 2.0. Flesh and Blood's rules getting a little cleaner, a little bit easier to understand, all part of the game evolving uh, and really coming into its own as we hit you know, this era of competitive play for Flesh and Blood. So maybe we need to start updating our own uh, terminology here that might make it better, especially when Chain is one of the heroes yes. in the game. <laughs> All right, Deru down to 18, taking a big turn here from Cody Williams. Cody Williams with that card in Arsenal, it looked like it was an unmovable. If not, there is one in his hand, it looks like, here as well. A little bit of blood debt damage, too, for mm -hmm. Cody for the first time. Obviously, if you do not play those cards from the Banished Zone, you are going to take blood debt damage, an important part of the equation with Chain. Now, talking about the blood debt, uh, I think it's pretty important that Cody blocks with his Carrion Husk soon, right? Absolutely. Given the size of this breakground, I assume this is going to be the spot where we see the Carrion Husk block. Uh, you lose access to it once you hit 13 or less life. The Carrion Husk will banish itself. The trick is with Carrion Husk, as soon as you do block with it, it's going to be banished. And it has blood debt. So it will sit in your zone. It will slowly deplete, deplete your life total. So finding the exact perfect spot to use your carrying husk is a very, very skill intensive part of playing chain. It seems like this is a good window for it, but maybe Cody just trying to get a little bit more of a look, trying to prevent some really important on hit effects. Cause again, this is clear. Hey everybody, welcome back to Indianapolis, Indiana. The Swiss is over. We've got a top eight. Flake, this is a stacked top eight from names and decks. But before we get to that, I want to talk one second. There's a battle hardened going on the side here. The top eight just started there. It looks like we've got one, two, three, three Bravos, uh, two Prisms, two Viscerai, and one Chain. I'm going to call this weekend the return of Runeblade and not just Viscerai as well, because we've got a Chain and a Briar in our top eight of the calling. All right, to, uh, to quote LL Cool J, don't call it a comeback because, honestly, Runeblade hasn't really gone anywhere. <laughs> They've been here for years. Yeah. yeah, they have been here for years. Uh, Chain, however, is uh, is that would be the comeback story, the return of the Mac, if you will. Yeah, and speaking of Chain, that's actually going to be the uh, one of the matchups that we're watching, the first matchup that we're watching here in the top eight. We're going to be watching Cody Williams, who's been playing Chain so well the entire tournament. I know you got to cast one of his matches earlier, and you were super impressed with how he played and the matchup that he actually, I think he played against Michael Hamilton in which he's playing a rematch here in this top eight. That is correct, T-Bone. It is, in fact, a rematch, my man. It is Michael Hamilton, who was the winner of the calling that was going simultaneously during the U.S. National. So uh, in that matchup, it is worth noting that he won the calling on Oldham with a lot of that fatigue strategy. That uh, So we saw him just completely, perfectly pilot and operate that strategy in this uh, in this particular matchup, so chain here on with Cody Williams, Michael Hamilton uh, on Bravo, just another guardian, but the same strategy employed. We'll get into that strategy a little bit more here in a second. Let's take a look at this entire top eight so you can see how it's going to go out. Uh, there's our number one seed, Fano Black. He's going to be up against. New England's favorite son. New England? New Eng Sorry, New Zealand's Whoa, favorite son. Oh, hello. Yeah, yeah. You're talking Come about on, that. It's that's been Tom, a long day. That's Tom Brady you're talking about. <laughs> well, I mean, Matt Rogers really is Tom Brady <laughs> of this game as well. So that's a tall order for Fano, but he's been up to it so far. This tournament has been doing so well against this Bravo star of the show. Speaking of Bravo, we've got a mirror match down at the bottom. That's Pat versus David, or Deep Root, as we've been calling him all the time guy from your neck of the woods. Yes, sir. Toronto Zone, uh, D. Rude, somebody who knocked me out of my very first ProQuest Top 8. A uh, friend of mine, Jacob Ball, making Top 8. He made Top 8 of U.S. Nationals as well with Prism, but uh, he's not very happy about who and what he's playing here in the Top 8. Oh, we saw what Briar can do against the Prism strategy and just how it can absolutely steamroll when it needs to. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's that matchup that we're watching down there at the bottom. That's Cody Williams versus Michael Hamilton. Bravo versus Chain. Uh, a matchup that I'm really looking forward to because 
there's going to be some metagaming inside this besides just what you normally have. Yeah, well, there's the macro meta, which we speak about, which is the Triangle of Doom, but then there's the micro meta of just the head-to-head -head matchup. This is a rematch. The information is there. The strategy is there. So perhaps there's a just a di different approach. We saw how Cody Williams was approaching the matchup against D-Rude, where, where uh, uh, Dave Rude was using a, employing a more aggressive strategy against the chain player, and that didn't quite pan out the way that D-Rude wanted it to. However, in this regard now, Cody went up against Michael Hamilton who employed a more fatigue strategy. Block out, I'll see you at the end of the, at the finish line, but I'm going to be the one crossing it. In this case, Cody might take a complete opposite approach here. Maybe get rid of some of those uh, important cards like the unmovables and maybe stack the bottom of the deck with a lot more of those red blood deck cards that he'll be able to play and string together so he doesn't run out of gas necessarily. And there's, it's definitely po important uh, to point out that Michael Hamilton's build of Starvo is a little different than the actual normal uh, build. So this one definitely leans into the ability of being able to do that, you know, fatigue plan a little bit better than your typical Starbo list. Yeah, this is going to be one of those uh, situations of if Cody's anticipating the fatigue, he'll prepare for it. But if Michael's anticipating that Cody's anticipating, then maybe he'll go for a more aggressive. So but if he knows that I know that he knows that, that you know. Exactly. Okay. So it's going to be one of those games. It's going to be uh, uh, really one of those situations of, well, is it a heads or a tails? Let's flip the coin. Let's see what happens. Both players have strategies ready for this. It's it's just one of them has to be it's if it's it's whether you know will Michael be hyper aggressive because Cody's anticipating the fatigue and teching for it or will Michael stick to his guns and can go for another fatigue match yeah because like let's say that they do get the way and for on Cody's side he doesn't bring in the defensive reacts or not a ton of them because he's like oh he's just gonna try to fatigue me I don't want to draw these cards and then all of a sudden few Starvo attack you, few Starvo attack you, and yeah. all of a sudden you're like, well, this is not what I signed up for. This is not how this happened last time. No, I figured this is going to be a situation where Michael's just going to go with what worked. Why not? I, I, agree. I agree with you there. Yeah. So we'll see. I believe the players should be uh, just about ready to rock and roll here, but Cody on chain and Michael Hamilton on Bravo Star of the Show, and it's worth noting again, Michael won a calling with a Oldham deck that ran a lot of fatigue strategy. And let's talk about uh, one thing as well. You know, we talk about this all this all this weekend. Uh, uh, the shield play. There's a rampart of Ram's Head in here, of course, in the in the Oldham. I'm sorry, in the Bravo Star of the show. I'm so used to Oldham having it as well. <laughs> uh, so important in this matchup versus chain. But we've seen Cody Williams, these chain players, play really well around breaking the actual combat chain. But sometimes you just have to do it. And when that happens, that plays into the Ramparts Ram's head so, so well. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to mark this down here, my friend. Do you believe it'll be a fatigue or do you believe it'll be a aggressive strategy? I'm going to go with fatigue here. I think you go with what's, what works because here's the thing. It was very good when they didn't know it's coming. If they do know it's coming, it's still good, right? The surprise obviously helps. You're going to have a couple cards in their deck that aren't very good, right? You know, they have a red unmovable in their deck when you're fatiguing them. That's really, really bad. But here's the thing. Chain is really good at taking whatever it's got and making the most of those cards. You can still pitch them for red and play some of your cards from Blood Debt and stuff like that. So I don't think you really break up the winning strategy. That's my opinion. Uh, Michael Hamilton, much better player than I am. But just a little bit. All, all right. right. All right. I think we're ready to rock and roll. A scotch. Let's figure it out. I mean, hey, we can talk about this all day long, but the game has to be played. And, uh, and yeah, they're, they're just basically just sleeving up, doing their stretches, as it were, getting all their chakras in order, you know, getting their chi working. It's funny. I actually was stretching right before this, sitting in this chair for a while. Your legs get a little, a little tight. I was getting ready for this top eight. And, honestly, I had some nervous energy for this top eight as well, watching uh, Matt Rogers get in at the last moment, watching D. Rude get in at the last moments of these players. But, I mean, you know, we try to be – you know, not root too hard for people in here, but it's hard to not root for the really cool storylines as well. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, you have a little bit of a rooting interest. So I was happy to see that ha happen for these players. You can see D-Rue was so happy and ecstatic after he top eight. For Matt Rogers, you know, it's another day. It's it's another calling top eight, but he still wants it. That fire's still there. Hey, sneaking into the top eight, there were, you know, that, that remember that game that we saw that really went down to the wire that last turn that he was able to cross the finish line for that win? If that went any other way, if there was one card that was different in his hand, it might not have worked out that way. So good for Matt Rogers again for sneaking in and just remaining. And he has said that the, the field in itself is improving. Yeah. So it's getting harder and harder for him to make these top eights. He's still the world number one, but we see the field just in general catching up to that leader.
Yeah, we're talking about the field improving. You know, you're seeing Jacob Ball here making making his second consecutive top eight, right? He's top eight at U.S. Nationals. He's top eighting here in Indianapolis. You're seeing Michael Hamilton possibly becoming a two-time calling champion, right? I, there's not many people that can say that. You're looking at his opponent, Cody Williams, maybe becoming a calling champion, starting to make a name for himself. Samuel Dando. This is something that I talked about at the very start of the show, that I thought a Briar would actually sneak into this top eight because, mm -hmm. A, I think the deck is a little bit better than some people think, and, B, if you get the right matchups, you know, we saw him playing against these Prism decks and just making a fool of them that he's going to sneak in, and uh, good for him. He's getting, that prism, he's getting that matchup that he wants at top eight, and unfortunately for Jacob Baugh, it's not unwinnable. It's not as bad as it could be. You know, this, this isn't Viserai into old him, but... This is not a good one for him, so look out to see maybe a possible upset in that matchup. I'm being told the players are shuffling up right now, so we'll be going down to the future area, future match area in, in a couple seconds. They're going to take a little bit longer than normal to shuffle up because most of the time while that's going on, they exchange deck lists here before the game starts, so they get to have full knowledge. So while Cody and Michael have already played, they're going to see the full number of that, and that's actually going to influence whether you know he plays for the uh, to, to see if he's going to play the D-Reacts or not and how they're going to choose, but... We each have our own opinions on that, so we'll see what happens. I have no, absolutely, and uh, I mean, I've, I'm just anticipating here for Cody in this matchup. Just, just you're gonna notice a lot of, oh, I don't want to say over pitching, but if there's a blue early game, he'll pitch red, red, something else in order to stack the bottom of that deck to get those big turns late game. I believe that that's what's going to be happening here in order to really, you know, uh, convert late. I mean, because the game that we saw that Cody lost against uh, Michael Hamilton, that last set of of you know ripping off the top was not as potent as typically a chain player would have liked. There was a lot of whiffs, and it was not necessarily that kind of, you know, full throttle that he would have needed. I'm actually wondering, the more I think about it with the chain player, is even if he doesn't, even if he thinks he's getting fatigued, and I think this might be the right move, you still might see some of the unmovables or some of the other stuff in his deck, just because he might just shuffle almost all of his cards in, just to play, you know, with a, a bigger deck than normal, to kind of maybe give himself that one extra turn yeah. in the fatigue matchup. It's not a bad strategy, and it's completely possible. Again, 60, 60 cards is the minimum. You can go above that. So if you want to go ahead and play to 70, let's say, it gives you another another turn. It gives you a little bit more runway so you can finally take off if necessary. And just being have another, another turn to just rip another eight or nine cards off the top, that could be the difference here. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, ultimately, Michael Hamilton does have one up on Cody, and but Cody at the time was nine and one. People were not ready for chain. You mentioned that you were expected a Briar to sneak in. I was I was on record saying that I thought a chain was going to be in there as well. So uh, yeah, you convinced me as well. Definitely, absolutely. And uh, there's a lot of chain players out there who you know it's they're they're very I don't want to say loyal to the hero, but the the um. The heroes that, that are the players who have have a lot of experience with chain know what they're doing and even though there's been a lot of bands and erratas etc that have really taken some key pieces like seeds of agony out of the equation the the plunder runs etc they're still finding ways to f you know to be able to navigate the turns are not nearly as explosive as they used to be but they're still viable and that's where the hero needs to be and i think they found a nice balance and found that the best chain players in the world are still able to go ahead and beat what people argue as just untouchable op yeah, and I, I got to agree with you there. Now, if you've been watching through the days and you've been seeing these decks and you wanted to get your hands on some of this product, Everfest First Edition is available now. If you like this Bravo star of the show, you can see him right there on your screen. He's available for you as well. Step right up. It's the greatest show in Wraith. It's coming to a town near you. Flesh and Blood First Edition is available now at StarCityGames.com and retailers worldwide. Look at those hammer pants. He went full on. I mean, let's get he can You can touch that. That's the thing. <laughs> Now's the time. Go get your Everfest. Yeah, and I, I got to talk about one more thing. We've talked about it once this, this weekend. I want to make sure that we mention it. The sustainability of this product. I got to give a huge shout out to LSS. Making the switch over to paper product and paper uh, packaging not only is it a more satisfying experience of ripping that pack open, the sound is great, the feel is great, but uh, I know that I recycle. I'm a big person on just sustainability in general when it comes to everything in life and not trying to waste products. And I'm a you know pretty big anti-plastic guy myself sometimes with packs and stuff. You know, a lot of people, we just throw them away. We're not recycling enough. So this product, being in paper, I think it's a big step forward for flesh and blood, but I think it's a big step forward for TCGs in general, and I fully expect other people to follow suit soon. And, and just from a selfish perspective, like you mentioned, just that feel of tearing them open. So nice. It is incredibly satisfying, let's be real. It's it's kind of like you're opening an Oscar, you know? Like yeah. you're just you're about to announce it. It's like, and the winner is Cold Foil 
Bravo star of the show. You know, yeah. that's kind of how that feels. But yeah, big ups to LSS for taking the lead on that. And uh, hopefully that a lot of the other, uh, you know, everyone else out there who's who making cards does the same thing because it just makes sense. It just makes sense. And again, from a selfish perspective, that tear, that little, oh, it's so good. It is so good. Also, I like the, the smell of a fresh pack. <laughs> And the paper ones just smell a little bit better, just to be oh. just to be a little weird for everybody at home. You know. The next thing after that is like, I like the taste of a good pack. <laughs> I don't go that far. No, no. Okay, all right. So I don't know how far we're going with this one. We That's got, my line. Yeah, right we, there. We got five senses. So, <laughs> all right, it's time for the match. I believe. I think we're done exploring all of the senses and how they relate to packs of Everfest. So, <laughs> let's get to the matchup, ladies and gentlemen. Cody Williams on chain. It's the rematch versus. Uh, Michael Hamilton on Bravo, star of the show. And we're going to get a lot of hints as to the strategy here in the first turn. It's the remix, Max. It's the remix. We'll have to see if we get a different finish uh, this time. Let's see who is going to be starting us off here. I want to see. Yep, it looks like Cody's going to be starting Shackle number one. And yeah. let's see what starts off his first turn here in the top eight. Oh, it looks like a Shackle and a pass. Not letting Hamilton get any kind of cycling going on in his hand. And that's fair, and that's perfectly fine. We saw what happened last time. Cody went, uh, went, um, you know, a little... He got aggressive early, allowed Michael Hamilton to cycle all the cards. And what was the result of that? Michael Hamilton had a, a, a fused Starvo at the beginning. So we're going to start with that would be a Spinal Crush. And uh, pitching over there to go in with a... That is a nine-point Spinal Crush. Nine damage coming in. The Crush effect here is four. Now, this has significant repercussions, Tannen, because Go Again is so important in Chain. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Command and Conquer here, Block, Grass Block, Arcane. Oh, Arknight. All right, this is the first clue. This is the first clue that Cody is putting Michael Hamilton on fatigue because this might be the first and only, uh, like, one of the first and few opportunities that Michael Hamilton's actually going to be attacking. It's most likely going to be all chain all the time. So being able to just go ahead and slide your equipment across the, uh, across the table and say, I'm probably not going to use this. I didn't use it last game, so does it really matter? And now Cody's going to start shackling. All right, invert existence, I believe. So that's going to attack the graveyard. Yeah, Cody only taking three there from that attack as well. Crush not going to happen, so it looks like we're going to have a belittle, and we're going to show a bounty demigod. That's going to go and find a minnowism. See a minnowism already in the pitch zone, but there's more copies behind this for Cody as well. Looks like a red minnowism is pulled up. That's going to be able to pump an attack here uh, as well if he wants to be able to do that. Blue one's usually got, uh, you're going to get those when you want some more extra resources. The red one, when you want to be able to pump up attack, maybe do some little, uh, some extra damage. Yeah, the issue was last game, Cody was not necessarily putting across enough damage. Usually on that last turn where your soul, sh your soul shackles really reveals your entire deck, Michael was at a healthy state, so it wasn't that important. This time, let's get the red minnowism. It beefs up my next attack. So I want to. I think Cody is just realizing that he needs to go full throttle. There's nothing that, that that's in his way that he should be, be pushing as much damage as quick as possible. I do want to point something out here that I'm a little surprised by, but I definitely trust Michael Hamilton to be better at this. And I am. There's a, a stalagmite bastion of eyes and loft in play here. You know, uh, this is what we mentioned last time as well. I had this discussion with Brian, and it did factor in because on those major plays, it did slow things down. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're going to have an Art of War played here. It looks like it's going into the plus one mode and a banish the card from hand. But let's be real. That's not actually a deterrent here. That's a feature. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's not a bug. It's a feature because that card is essentially uh, accessible whenever. But Blizzard... That's going to slow things down here. And now the cards that he had in hand, this really throws a wrench in the system because the, when a good player is going to have all his resources used as efficiently as possible, and Blizzard really pumps the brakes on, on your game plan. Yep, so that is going to lose go again unless another card is pitched here. Cody kind of incentivized into having to do this. So the second Minnowism is going to be pitched from his hand here, the one that he got off of that Belittle. Bounding Demigon is going to be exiled, so the two cards are going to come back to hand here. To go again will resolve. Yeah, that uh, bounding demigon in the banish zone now. The the go again is fine, but keep in mind here that that art of war is going to be pumping up all the future attacks here. I don't believe he's soul shackled yet, so it's another go again that he'll be able to pull off. Yep, absolutely. Looks like one damage going on on over to Michael Hamilton, down to thirty nine. Now what's fascinating here as well is that Cody is 
that's I believe is that two minnowisms that he's pitched this turn. Uh, late game, those might come back to haunt you. Those are going to be banished and gone away. But keep in mind that belittle is another way to fish those out of the deck. And looking at Cody's list, he has three red minnowisms and two blue minnowisms. And uh, that's one of each, I believe, in the pitch zone now. So he might be able to go ahead and, and pick those up. But again, shuffling your deck can be detrimental when you're trying to stack your list late. Absolutely. That's actually really important. It's a small thing that doesn't come up very often, but when it does, it can be really impactful. If you've actually been pitch stacking really well as a span of the game and then you shuffle late, hands aren't going to be as good as the ones that you crafted. So again, blocking with Pulverize, blocking with Crippling Crush, I mean, these are just very powerful cards that are blocking for three. Yeah, this is a Hollow Rights coming for five, blocked by Crippling Crush, Crush, like you said, and this is starting to feel like old school Guardian. You know, you have all these big expensive attacks in your hand, but you're almost never using them. You're just block for three, block for three, block for three. Yeah, the old school showstopper, it was just, uh, you know, you pick and choose when you can go ahead and pick those attacks, and it's got to be, you got to be patient. Sometimes, you know, it, it, you might think, okay, I, if I just eat five damage, I can come back with a, a Crippling Crush, and it's going to feel awesome. But, you're eating damage, and in a game where fatigue is the, is the is on the menu, you cannot take any damage where you should not take damage. Went back over to Michael Hamilton. It looks like it's just going to be a cold four coming across here. Winter's Whale coming across for four damage on hit. Give your opponent a frostbite. What Cody is also going to be thinking about here is that last game in the match, uh, the, the carry on Husk really didn't come into play. So... You might see a Carrion Husk just eat a Frost Hammer, uh, but it's going to be as late as possible so he doesn't eat too much blood debt. But last uh, last game, he missed an opportunity to sort of eat, a, eat up one of these these fours, be it cold or, or warm or room temperature or anything in between. Whether it's Fahrenheit, Celsius, or Kelvin, you got to eat that damage in some way or form. And that Carrion Husk is something that you want to make use of that Cody did not have adva the advantage of last game. That's a really, really good point. You know, something that doesn't come up very often because, you know, we don't see fatigue decks as much anymore is in chain is when is something huskable? That is a big deal in these matches. So if Michael pulls off another big attack in the next few turns, you might see that husk just come out. Yeah, I mean, ideally you want it to, to, to eat up the damage that you would see off of, let's say, the Spinal Crush or whatever. The problem was is that it was too early to commit a Carrion Husk where if you play it now and you play seven more turns in the game, that's seven damage. And that could definitely change gears here where maybe Michael Hamilton sees that, yeah, you're eating one Blood Dead a turn. Maybe that seven damage is enough for me to change gears and continue to push face here. So a uh, Frostbite is on hit. We see Cody Williams is at 31. But again, Chain doesn't get going until Soul Shackle 4, 5, 6. And that's where we see the fireworks. Absolutely. So we're making our way up there just... A little slowly. It's going to take a little bit of time. This is an early game. We've got a few things set aside here about bounding Demigon and inverting assistance, chipping away at Cody's life total. But like you said, that life total maybe not as important as it normally is against Bravo because we're not going to be getting those huge attacks all the time. All right, going to start this turn off of Mavian Skies. There goes the Frostbite token. Those time snap potions are in the deck here. Just, just to notice that there, we're maybe seeing some extra cards start to have found their way into the chain deck. Looks like the Bounding Demigon is going to get played here. No, you're absolutely right. That's a very uh, you know, key piece there, the fact that the Time Snap Potions are in there. And when you can't manufacture Go again, having a Time Snap Potion on the board in a situation where you can get that extra action point, you can stretch that turn out and really force Michael Hamilton to take damage, that's very important. These are cards that I don't believe were in the original matchup, but again, knowledge is power in this, and you did just see these two players square off not an hour and a half ago. I mean, knowing is half the battle, don't forget that. So this on Holiday, <laughs> this Bounding Demigod is attacking for four. We have a sink below matching up to it, and it does look like we are actually going to sink, so Michael's going to put a card from... Whoop, but, yep, there we go. Part, a card from the bottom of, from his hand to the bottom of his deck and draw a new one here. A little bit of filtering, possibly setting up an attack for his, his turn. But, like we said, Michael thinks he's going to take this game a little slow and easy. So that's one of two sink belows that Michael Hamilton has in the deck. There's about, I believe there's nine total defense reactions. So there we go. The Soul Shackle is getting activated. And this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. I know that we don't have the Ram's head here, but this is what we're talking about. The chain is broken there. The combat chain is broken whenever you make the Soul Shackle. So that's why you see all the cards go away. And then we have another Soul Reaping attacking with for free because we're banishing a card from her hand. And the Hollow Rites go into the banish zone, which it'll be back later. Oh, it'll definitely be back later. As you see over there, you may banish one or more cards from your hand rather than pay for Soul Reaping's cost. But, hey... 
that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of attack that's coming through over here. So you know, Cody Williams does have the deficit here, and he has been taking blood debt damage. So Michael Hamilton, despite not really attacking very much or or being too aggressive, is letting Cody Williams just essentially you know self destruct to a degree. And the, you do have those ticking fuses that will eventually cause that that end game explosion. But at the moment now, it's it's again like I said. It's when you hit that Soul Shackle 456 that we really see Chain ramp up, and we're going to see Michael Hamilton begin to really struggle with these attacks. Looks like we're going to see the Turn Tipper come in and block up some of this, and then there's going to be a use of two of the resources here to make sure Grasp of the Arcanine gets to make a Rune Chant token here, and that's going to be followed by an attack from the Rosetta, which is going to be for two and two. There's a rune chant that's associated with that as well, and that's a nice little extra piece of damage. Again, it's it's how it's divided, and it doesn't get too... It's not clear-cut. It's not too easy to figure out sometimes. It's got to take a little creative accounting in order to make sure that none of this gets through. But again, Michael Hamilton's on a full defense strategy here. So if, as long as... I think the, the major thing that he's worried about here is all, all Michael Hamilton wants is a blue ice card, or any blue, frankly, at that rate, to just slow down and pressure Cody to any degree. It does look like he's going to take, I think, four of this down to 33. Uh, I don't believe that there was a non-attack action played ahead of this, so I think it's just two plus the one, which is still, it's three, which Michael Hamilton, uh, Hamilton apparently just gladly uh, gladly took there. Yeah, and Michael Hamilton goes down to 33. Cody down to 29 off two blood debt for himself. Now we're back over to Michael Hamilton. is going to put that tunic up. Does he have an attack this turn? It looks like he does. It looks like this Winter's Whale is going to come in here. Glacial Footsteps getting pitched. You know, this is where you really see the difference in his list from the other Starvo lists that we have here in the top eight or throughout this tournament. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the whole thing with Glacial Footsteps is that you fuse it to gain Dominate. And a lot of players playing Starvo are relying on the hero ability, you know, on Bravo himself to allow for that to happen. And also, it, it, it's an expensive card to play. Uh, it's not necessarily the standard, you know, pitch three, play a card. So uh, a very... You know, a, a little swerve away from the norm with cards like Glacial Footsteps. Now, it was only a little shackle for two, but we did hit a 50% here. We do have a Blood Debt card, a Ghostly Visit being put on Layaway a little bit here, maybe making an appearance this turn, making an appearance next turn. We'll have to see how Cody Williams wants to approach the attack this turn. He's down to 25, but his life total is not the one that's in jeopardy as much from attacking. Michael Hamilton's being very into the full-on defense this game, like we'll be talking about. You know, could change gears to the drop of a dime. But Cody's not going to know when that's happening. Well, he knows how to play defense, like we mentioned, playing Oldham to a calling win. And you, you're not playing Oldham because you're aggro. You're playing Oldham because you like control. And here we go. Here's another start to a big turn from Cody here. This is one of the best cards in the chain deck. This is an Art of War. He's going to banish a card from his hand to draw two cards, but that card, is gonna, that card from his hand is going to come back later in another ghostly visit. Now, I did just catch a glimpse of an unmovable in his hand, too. I do think we're playing with a uh, stacked deck here, just a lot of extra cards from Cody to make sure that it's a little harder to fatigue him. I mean, having it in there, I guess it's if it gets banished, it gets banished. But it's not bad because, again, if Michael Hamilton can find a, a, a seam here where, an, a, let's say, a fused Okinol comes at Cody, he, he, having it at an opportune time is not the worst thing. I mean, you could always pitch it. You could do something with it, banish it or whatnot. But ultimately, it's not the worst thing in the world to have against a Bravo player. You can't have a deck of 60 all-star cards they're not all fire you got to have a few you know burning embers here and there exactly so we got attack for four here from this ghostly visit Let's see we got a block for three from hand for michael hammond does anything else do we want to prevent this with seeds no it lo looks like the one's going to get there so michael hammond down to 32 what's the next attack cody has lined up here we'll have to see this could be a, the start of a pretty big turn if michael hamilton could get out of this with some cards i mean this could definitely change because it seems like Cody Williams is really just not necessarily, he's not creating soul shackles. He's not playing the cards that are being banished here. So he's taking some blood debt tax. You know, it's, it's, it's occurring to a degree here where Michael Hamilton is just watching that self implosion. Yeah, he's not actually having to push damage, right? Like you're seeing Cody Williams taking three damage, two damage almost every turn. And then you've got the Winter's Whale coming in, maybe chipping in for a little damage here. And then Michael can pivot almost whenever he wants to. There's going to be a turn where he's like, okay, well, I'll take the damage this turn because it's not that threatening. And now, if, since he might have Starvo in his hand, he can have a huge, huge attack. Looks like we've got a Captain's Call to plus two, the next attack. Looks like the chain is getting broken here. Soul Shackle, the next attack is going to have go again here. Resource floating is going to use to be another ghostly visits coming in. I think this one for six. 
Yeah, so just taking a quick look here, making sure that everything's on the level that Captain's Call offering the plus two, and like you mentioned, inheriting or, or, or manufacturing a go again with the Soul Shackle. So uh, I believe that's so it's, it's taking the plus two. Is, is that coming in for six here, or is it just the four? All right, so a block of glacial footsteps here. We'll see in just a quick second here. Uh, so it was coming in for just... Uh, for just the one so I believe that's just coming in for four so uh, as it stands right now Rosetta as a two and two this is where it starts to get spicy uh, Tannen yeah, absolutely two and two this is going to be presenting damage on two different fronts we got two physical two arcane got to put some pressure on Michael to be able to take care of all of this now he does have those no rune boots but that only prevents one at a time because this is one instance of two but that crown of seeds still sitting there and it looks like it might be time to use that so yep resource off the tunic, prevent one of the arcane. It's going to block, and it does look like he's not going to use the seeds here. So a little tiny bit of damage is going to get through here. I'm sensing that there's a D-React that's going on in that uh, arsenal. Seedsing a D-React is definitely not... It's not a good EV in that case, so I think he's waiting for one of those super tall, really high up there um, attacks. So that Captain's Call may have been a situation where choosing the plus two off an attack, but that uh, attack, I believe, has to be a certain cost or greater, which I think the ghostly visit was not, so in which case, at, at this rate, it was just a matter of using a non-attack to fuel a better Rosetta Thorn. Absolutely. It looks like Michael went down to 30 this turn. Good, he's going to take a little bit of blood debt. He's gotten rid of most of his cards. There's still that unhallowed right sitting around, and there's going to draw back up to four, and we're back over to Michael. Does Michael want to do anything on his turn? He looks like he's going to power up that tunic, and we're just going to keep doing the same thing he would be doing, swinging for this cold four. That hammer, and again, a card like Channel Lake Frigid is such an important piece against Chain. It just really slows down what they want to do. It really sucks resources out of their hand in order to fuel those wide turns. But again, it, it, at the rate that this is going, it doesn't seem like Cody has had those massive turns that he is looking for. So pitching the Channel Lake Frigid now, no reason to hold on to it. What I'm very curious of is what is in that arsenal? I still think that it's like a, a, a staunch response or a turn timber. This looks like a really bad banish so far, and that is a complete whiff. Two Belittles and a Mavian Sky is going to be put away. Then a Hollowed Rites, though, still sitting there, ready to be turn. There is an Arsenal card for Cody here as well. And Cody going to count his deck. And it's important here, too, because you have to make sure that, you know, you have the right numbers in the math set out. So when you're drawing cards and, sh and shackling, you got to make sure that your last turn where you're shackling for, let's say, a six, you're not just ripping three cards off. Or you're shackling for seven and you're really losing value. you got to keep that in mind, that the math is turning out. This It's a very intricate way to keep track of this stuff, especially with chain. So you got to keep a, a real close eye on your deck limit here and or the, your card count and how many times you're shackling. It seems like Cody is not as aggressive on the shackles as he was uh, in previous games. Yeah, it seems like he's only doing it when he absolutely has to or needs to. Now, this is something we saw from the chain players in Vegas. They would pick their deck up and show, uh, count it every now and then to see, when am I going to be getting to these specific things? This is another card that just got pitched here that I thought was going to be important in this matchup. There is an Eclipse. You can maybe set up a turn where you get that Ursa into play. It's a little difficult, but it is doable, especially with those time snap potions that we saw on the deck. And it looks like... We've got a, is that a shadow puppetry into an unhallowed rights? It is definitely a, uh, I mean, it's the start of a nice thing, let's just say. At that rate, it is, in fact, shadow puppetry, which is a great card. It's one of these staples for chain decks. Uh, it, does, it does a little bit of everything. It gives plus one attack, go again, and if it hits, look at the top card of your deck, you may banish it. So that could just stretch out that turn again, but most importantly, it's giving this turn a little bit more runway, a little bit more longevity. Absolutely. So let's see how Michael wants to respond to this. We've got an attack. Coming in from here. Michael just weighing his options here again. He knows that he's in full defense mode, so there's not really a situation here where he's he's saying, okay, can I, can I just take a little bit of damage and keep a good hand? The Really, if you're playing on fatigue, you need to commit to it from the get-go. The second that you pivot off of it, it will come back to haunt you. Uh, playing fatigue against chain is a very, very, very effective strategy. However, you cannot take that carrot on a stick. It might look like, okay, if I eat five here, I might be able to come back with something nastier. But that is that is a very, very attractive thing, but it will eventually lead you astray. It does look like a Crippling Crush is going to come out to play and block here, but it is still going to leak through a little bit of damage. We're seeing Cody resolve the Shadow Puppetry here. That card, he wants to keep it. He doesn't want to banish it. 
Looks like we've got a making of a soul shield. I'm sorry, soul shackle here. That's up to four. I've been calling prism way too many times <laughs> today. So soul shackle up to number four. Chain is broken. Rosetta Thorn. Yeah, that's it. In. Two and two, Rosetta Thorn. I mean, that's where you want to be with that. It's just break up that damage. And I still believe that if he's not seizing the second piece of that arcane package, that that's got to be a D react in there. He, we know he's running nine, three unmovable. Uh, sorry, I believe there is a. Uh, where we, what do we got here in terms? We've got three staunch responses, three turn timbers, two sink blows, and the pulse. So he's well suited to just start tanking damage, uh, you know, or, or throwing out the big boys. So if he's holding on to it, I think that's what it's for. Yeah, it looks like a rift bind. Going to finish up here and attack for three. Uh, rift bind, a card that used to be the one that killed you in these decks. You would want it to be late in the game. You'd be putting it towards the bottom of your deck along with your Seeds of Agonies, and you'd see the turns of start with Seeds and Agony from Banish, maybe play about three more of them, play some other stuff, and then Rift Bind for nine on some of these turns. But this is a card that's just a good value card now. You still need that certain amount of Blood Debt cards in your deck to make sure you have enough going for these for these Soul Shackles to be good. So that Rift Bind was from hand, so it does not get the um, the benefit of having a boost based on the non-attacks that were there. Uh, that's not the ideal place. Usually you want to rip those from your Banish Zone. Those are the ones that you want to be pitching early to rip off the top with the Soul Shackles late. But you know what? You, you poke in damage where you can. And at this rate, Michael Hamilton has only got a one-point edge despite all the work that Cody's done. Uh, we got Arsenal's on both sides. Speaking of poking in damage, last card in Michael's hand. He keeps working out this way. It's a nice card. This is a cold four coming in over to Cody Williams. Cody... Hasn't taken damage from himself for the first time in a while here. No blood debt cards left over, but this is a Winter's Whale coming in for four. I wonder if this is the opportunity, perhaps, where he's even considering with the Husk, but I think that, yeah, getting rid of an Unmovable is the right move here. You definitely don't want to leave that in your arsenal too much. It's going to start messing up your turns on the next few turns. Not to mention, you're not necessarily anticipating you know, any of those Oganolds. You're not anticipating any of those Glacial Footsteps. None of that is really po problematic at this rate because you know what the strategy is. You just look back at the last game and say that he swung at me once with an actual attack, and that's it. It was just hammer time the whole way. And you still got your husk, too, for that one. You know, if it does randomly happen in the next few turns. Sorry, so Cody... Top four cards of his deck. Let's see. Any Blood Debt cards? I see at least one. Bounding Demigon... Oop, we got two bounding demigods this turn, so back to 50%. Cody going to be cooking with a little bit of extra ingredients this turn. I mean, that's not so bad, right? I mean, 50% will get you in the Hall of Fame any day of the week. If you're ratting 500, ultimately, let's be real here. The bounding demigod is, uh, it's, it's, these are cards, man, I'm telling you that you wish you had seen a little bit later. You can chain them together with something else. But a minnowism is going to fuel up what this can do. Now you're getting a little bit above board. Yeah, Soul Shackle up to five here. It's going to need the bounding demigod. Go again. Bounding Demigod, you're going to get a plus from the Minnowism and a plus from being Caster Maxwell. That is a large Bounding Demigod. It is a, it's a jumping Bounding Demigod. It's a leaping <laughs> Bounding Demigod All for right. seven. Well, there's a staunch response. That's a nice little answer there. So, again, having all of those D-Reacts and having them well-timed, no, nothing left on the table, as it were, as the seven blocks the seven, nice and clean. Nothing, you know, nothing venture, nothing game. But we're going to go ahead in here and create another uh, another sorry, Rune Chant, and this is what you want to do. Two, two, and one, baby. Uh, just come in for a little bit more poke. Yeah, so it's going to have an instance of one arcane, an instance of two arcane, and an instance of two physical, so a lot to deal with here. So we do finally see that arsenal going away. Seeds of Agony finally getting used here. I'm sorry, see, Crown of Seeds. I'm so set back in the old chain days. Crown of Seeds here, going to prevent one, put up a shield here. Let's see what's going to go on with some of those other things. We still got these Null Rune Boots available to us. Let's see how much Michael wants to be able to take this turn if he wants to be able to block out almost all of it. Well, so the timing on this has to be careful as well because he's crowned now before the rune chant has resolved. So it, um, he has to be able to eat that rune chant so that the crown protection will protect the additional... Uh, okay, so he's opting in this case to do it that way. That seems a little bit fascinating in terms of how uh, the sequencing is. He must really value some of the cards. Okay, so he just, he'd just he rather just take the damage and keep that card to swing uh, swing more pressure, but he's going to eat two here uh, the arcane way. Yep, so it does look like two, putting Michael Hillman down to 23, Cody Williams at 24. He's going to join him at 23 in just a second here. That Bounty Demigon is going to do one to him at the end of turn. Yep, there we go, 23 each. Back over to Michael Hamilton. Let's talk about what he had left over in his hand. Let's see. Make sure he wants to make sure that he can just keep attacking with his Winter's Whale maybe really prioritizing getting, yeah, I was going to say, look, getting a card left over. This is a warm four, so no frostbite here. And there's a card left over to be put in that arsenal after this. Uh, that's spring tunit. Definitely want to mention up to three here. So a little extra resources, maybe being able to use uh, the crown of seeds to get an extra card as well. 
really impactful stuff coming over here from Michael. Well, if he's, he might be able to arsenal this, right? And then maybe be able to actually use Tunic to swap that arsenal for another card. And if Cody whiffs here, if it's not a very impressive turn, despite Michael playing hyper defensive, he might get a swing in here. He might be able to find the cards he needs. But here comes the soul, uh, the soul shackles. Well, since it was a warm four that like we talked about, there's no cold. I think Cody's just completely okay with, yeah, just, just come on. I'll take this four, keep all my cards. And it looks like we got two more. Here we got a Shadow Verser and another Rift Bind getting put into Banish here. So they're going to be able to come out and play this turn if they want to. Cody playing with a lot of cards here. He's got a four card hand, an arsenal, and three cards in his Banish zone. And this is what you're talking about. This is this is the turn five shackle, or this is the fifth shackle of the game. These are the turns where stuff starts getting really dangerous if you're Michael because these turns get really complicated, really long. A bunch of different attacks are going to hit the stack here. And it's going to be a little harder to defend because you're not sure what's coming next. I think Michael also needs to be very, very disciplined here because if he just if 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 he sees that carrot on a stick that he might be able to come back with a, a fused or dominated attack, yeah, that sounds attractive, but at what cost? Because we see how close these games get on those last turns. And if Cody pops off, Michael may have been kicking himself to say, I wish I had just, you know, five more health or six more health or one more health in that regard. So Michael may just see here that you know, based on this these particular soul shackles here, it might just be too much for him to absorb to be able to swing back. So I think at this rate, Michael will be, again, just he needs to remain disciplined. He needs to stick to the plan. The, the one thing that you cannot do when you're when you're set out to fatigue chain is is take a bite of that apple and say, uh, you know what, I'll take five to deal seven because chain doesn't care because chain's going to kill you before, you know, by the end of the game uh, when 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 like he goes right up to the edge of the cliff and then pushes you off. Michael did some housekeeping here. Going to look through what's going on here over in the graveyards, over in the bandage zone. Very important, too, because you want to know what's coming and what to not expect. You know, seeing three rift binds, let's say, and what color are they, you know, how many shadows of Urser, and everything beyond that. You know, taking a look of what's going on. There's The information, like you mentioned, is available, right? So if you've done the studying and you know what the, the key elements are and all the surprises, you can see how many of what are, are, are still you know, around, you know, behind curtain number one, so to speak. Yeah, one of the important things to note here, two of the Art of Wars are already gone here for Cody Williams. Those are the cards that can really push in this matchup, and we haven't seen them do, uh, be as good as they possibly could be. We've seen them be good, but not as good as they possibly could be, because that's so big at this matchup. If you get the really big, long, extended Art of War turns, like in the turns like this, where you could possibly attack three, four times, you know, banish a card, draw two more, these are the turns that can give Michael Hamilton a lot of problems because if you start to get him down to a lower life total then he's got to turtle up even more and then you're getting more and more advantage of pushing through those last points of damage so keep in mind cody's got three nice cards there that he's banished with those soul shackles so the hand as it is in you know he's got a four plus an arsenal plus the three that's f you know that's f eight cards at his disposal now, Cody definitely has a lot to think about here. I saw a Captain's Call and the last Art of War in his hand here, so possibly a big turn brewing for Cody here. Let's see how he wants to do this. He's going to start with the Shadow Verser, it looks like. Yeah, Shadow Verser is the way to you know pop off here. You start with that bad boy. It's just, you know, you're just kind of opening things up, as it were. You're going to banish a card from his hand, give it to go again here. Attack you for two with go again. Just... And these are the ones that I like starting off with as well. It's got to go again, right? It's an, it's an early exploratory attack. It's also attacking for two, right? So the only clean blocks that Michael has of this are cards like Crater Fist, or he could just, you know, prevent one here with, like, the Crown of Seeds. It feels bad sometimes to block with something that's got block three on a two when you know that there's other attacks coming this turn. You, you don't really want to overblock too much if you can. All right, so that, uh, that indicator there on, on Bravo is basically saying, all right, I got a Seeds that's, uh, that's on, you know, on the docket here. I've got one in the pocket, but he opts here just to take the one uh, instead of the two, be using that Seeds protection on this Shadow Verser. Yeah, it looks like this Howl from Beyond is going to get played from the Banish Zone here. This is going to pump up the next attack. I think this is a red one, so it should pump up the next attack by three. Chain is going to make the sixth Soul Shackle. Unhauled Rights being a, uh, played from the Arsenal. Here we go. It's going to have Go again. It's going to get pumped up by... That Halford Beyond now, it's going to be able to put the Halford Beyond from 
there onto the bottom of his deck as well. A card is really important in this matchup. Going to put some more cards on the bottom of his deck to make sure he gets through them when he starts to get to the second cycle of his deck. Seven go again. We've already seen a two. A little tickle, a little appetizer, if you will. And here's the seven. Again, those nasty break points. But uh, we're coming in with a block. That's a Spinal Crush block, an Autumn's Touch block. We want to make sure that a, as minimal amount of damage that is going to leak through. That's how Hamilton got through in the last game. That's how Cody is aware of what the game plan is, uh, is going to be, uh, you know, effectuated against him. So he's preparing for this, but you still need to be aggressive here. Yep, here we go. Rosetta for two and two. Let's see Michael, a couple cards in his hand, talking it over with his opponent. Looks like we're going to have a block from hand possibly here. Well, again, we're thinking about this in terms of, like, what has Michael's – uh, you know, strategy been here. It's just try to keep one card where possible. Two would be ideal, so you can jam an arsenal. But it, that looks like exactly what Michael's done here. He's going to take two arcane. It's a package deal again. Two, a little little package of two. But uh, he's going to have two cards, and that is going to be very effect uh, effective late uh, later. You're going to pitch a blue to swing hammer. Hopefully, it's an ice. You jam another arsenal card that is going to be able to cycle and uh, offer a little bit more protection. Got an update from our side matches here in the top eight, kind of like we predicted. And unfortunately for Jacob Ball, he was not able to overcome the Briar player. Sam is going to be moving on into our quarterfinals. A good tournament for Jacob Ball, second consecutive top eight, but it's going to end really quickly here in this top eight. He was happy to make the top eight when I was talking to him after the round, but he was like, why me? <laughs> well, I mean, somebody had to face the Briar, and it's just unfortunate that it was the prism. We saw the steamroll action that Briar did uh, and, and, and how just the, the sheer strength and and you know frequency of those attacks all right so as it stands now it's just it's a it's a cold four as you would a nice little four pack that's being thrown at him and uh in this case he, the beautiful part about this is michael hamilton's going to get away with not just a four attack with the ice kicker but also the fact that you're going to be able to slide a card in the pocket i think a four pack would actually be preferable to a six pack a lot of the times uh not in canada my friend uh uh, a six pack's called a uh, called a half day's work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it does look like like this attack is huskable as well. So husk, that's going to be a damage every turn of the game for Cody Williams. But he was down to 17. It was about time for that husk to come out and play. You want to make sure that you do get that block in. It might have been a problem if you didn't another time. So look, here we go. This should be a big turn for Cody. This is a six shackle. One of those unmovables gone. There's a tome as well. Oh is this no! He almost whiffed the last card. Thankfully was a shadow of Urser form here, but those are five cards that he's not going to have access to for the rest of the game here. All right. Now, if there was a lining of the silver variety, it means that that's, that's a lot of, you know, whiffs that you may not see in the next turn. So he's going to do his best here to really get things rolling and just make the best he can. And ultimately, the next show, the next, the next uh, soul shackle that comes out might be seven, and it might be really good. And what Michael's doing here is he's counting the deck left over because he wants to know how many more draws do you actually have here. If you're going to banish six cards next turn, possibly seven cards next turn, and then the turn after that, that might mean you only have two or three more draws of actual cards left in the deck, and that's telling Michael how much how much more he has to defend for the rest of his game and how much longer he has to just hold on until the chain player is actually just run out of cards. Yeah, he's going full ho Hodor mode here. <laughs> it's just Hold the door. It's, yeah. it's still too soon, by the way. It might be too soon. Uh, that was the best show that had five great seasons that I'll ever talk yeah, about. Yeah, there was never there was never a sixth or seventh. <laughs> just, just five totally great seasons. <laughs> Looks like we've got a chain activation here, Soul Shackle. Number seven. Let's see what action is going to have go again here. Mobby and Sky's pitch is going to get some resources here. This looks like a Vexing Malice. That another is, uh, another attack that comes in two different ways. Yeah, it's a, it's the red one, so that's a three plus two on top there. So, uh, you know, there he goes. Thank you, Cody. Exactly. Thank you, Cody. That's a nice little visual aid there for us. But, yeah, three is still not that bad. Again, it's not that break point of four. You can block it with one card if necessary, but it does come in in two different ways, like you mentioned. And the Soul Shackle enables the go again on this, so it's it's five split in two ways, but it's still, in my opinion, a, a very nice start here. You're getting through. What you need to do if you're Cody is just start chipping away at that life total. All right, back over to Michael here. Let's see what he's got to defend. He does have a card in his arsenal, so Crown of Seeds is available to him. Along with those four cards in his hand, let's see how he wants to approach this. 
Stick to the plan, Michael. That's basically what you got to think about here, which is just soak up as much damage as efficiently as possible. And part of that is going to be here with the Crown of Seeds. So Crown of Seeds activation card is going to go to the bottom. Card draw here. We've got, a, we've got a, a shield of one floating around in front of Bravo here. So probably blocking one of this arcane. There's two resources left over here. If he wants, he has access to Null Rune Boots. So he can kind of make both of these arcanes go away and then maybe block one card from hand. That would be a full block. But let's see if that's what he wants to actually do this turn. Yeah, Null Rune Boots are going to come in clutch here. And the, the, the problem is, is that sometimes this arcane, like on Vexing Malice, like on a Supercharged Rosetta the Thorn, it comes in a package of two and you can only deal with one. So that's where Seeds is so important. But Seeds is useless without an arsenal. I, I keep saying this. Seeds is already one of the better equipment made in the game. When you combine it with uh, Fendal Spring Tunic, it's just utterly busted, right? And then you start to see the other little things that keep making it good, right? You get this provision of the of the one damage really mattering in matchups like this where you have instances of arcane that aren't one. When you have them of two, like you said, it comes in a package deal, so dealing with all that is, is difficult. So it does look like maybe I think one of the arcane did actually get through here, and this break ground is going to block all the fizzle damage. So it looks like... Michael down to 19 here. So if he's keeping two floating, it might be a potentially that he's holding on to a staunch response or one of those two cost D reacts is my uh, my guess here because there's no reason he if he's if he is holding on to it that he or if he isn't holding on to it that he wouldn't just use one of those extra uh, floating resources to use the null rune boots to absorb the second instance of uh, or the the additional instance of uh, of arcane. A lot of cards left over in Cody Williams' hands. I think he's got about two left, along with that arsenal, plus all the cards that are in his Banish. All right, so we got a Shadow Puppetry coming here. Let's break the chain there, buddy. New chain. Brian was talking about this earlier. If we're talking about it in this matchup, we're going to say Combat Chain. It's a little too much with the, the Hero Chain and the Combat Chain, because I'm going to get confused. <laughs> so we got to make sure that we don't confuse me, okay? All right, so attack with the Rift Bind here for five. It's going to have a cool on hit. If it hits here, he's going to be able to look at the top guard of his deck. If he wants, he can banish it. You know, if it's a card of blood debt, might be doing that just to get an extra card next turn to be able to hit, or maybe even this turn, depending on what's got, what he's got going on behind this. I don't want to confuse you, Tannen, so I'm going to remind you, I am not a racehorse. Uh, I've, I've been reminded a few times today. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta, I'm going to write it. I'm going to write it on my hand. Okay. Uh, all right. Two Hold things. On. Yeah. Not. A, what was it again? Uh, there is no Discord. That's there, the other one. Okay, there, there is no Discord. And I am not a racehorse. Okay, not uh, a racehorse. Perfect, okay. excellent. Uh, so this is an awesome Rift Bind here because it does really take uh, a lot of... It, it really maximizes the potential of what a Shadow Puppetry can do, giving it the go again, the plus one, plus the Rift Bind looks at the non-attacks prior to it. So it's a nice five for a pretty cheap price. Yeah, Turn Timber coming in, take care of that. Now we see a Rune Chant being followed up by a Rosetta Thorn, and this is going to be the 1-2-2. The one, two, two. Yeah, the 1-2-2, two, two, again, a little Texas two-step, a little 2-2-1 two, two, or how it was, a little, you know, take that bad boy to the dance floor. But ultimately, so the two float that we saw earlier was, in fact, for a D-React. So I, I thought I, that's what I thought it was going to be there for because there's no other reason for it to float it, but that's the way to go, and it's a nice uh, usage of the D-React. So, but he is still... He's still soaking some damage here. He's still holding on to some cards. So I'm wondering if Michael is just doing the same math that Cody is in terms of how many more turns he'll have to, to absorb. But as it was last game, I think Michael was more closer to 16-18 at this point. So uh, Cody is doing a lot better a lot better job but at the same time with all of those cards left in the blood debt it's like a snake eating its tail just to sustain itself yep you see three cards up there two of which can be played that carrion husk will forever be blood dead in cody williams uh, a cold four coming through here from michael hamilton uh looks like all four of it has been received to cody so he's going to get a frostbite uh added to his side of the board here and it looks like michael hamilton is going to arsenal up and pass Oh yeah, that is that is a very big indicator um, ultimately here. When you're just taking it like that as Cody with some more of that blood debt that is just continuously accumulating, that means that there is some big stuff coming in. And so this might be just Cody saying, I remember what I pitched. I think we're at that point now where my next, uh, there it is, look at that. I think we're almost to the bottom of the deck. I think this is right at the bottom of the, of the deck, into the second. Because, like I said, we haven't seen this card as far as I remember. It might have been pitched. I, I missed it earlier. But it does look like, what is this, six cards that he's got available to him here? Yeah, and a full grip as well. That's why he took that, uh, that's why he took that hammer. Uh, I do have another result from the matches going on other than this one. The dream stays alive for David Rude. 
Uh, he's going to move on to the next round. I think he beat Pat here in the top eight. Uh, a small little fist pump from my... My man! Here. Not only because he's, uh, you know, one of my boys, but also the fact that he's rocking that Expos hat. I that love that Expos hat. Expose the elements. is uh, That's the... Oh. Uh, we got to get a meme going on that as well. And fellow Canadian as well. That's pushing correct. his way through the top eight. Now, let's start up a big turn. Here we go. We've got an Art of War being played here. Looks like it's going to be the plus one variety. Banish a card from his hand, draw two cards. This might be a very big turn, Flake. Hold on to your butts. It looks like we're about to do a ton of things. Here are two cards drawn to Cody. If he's got enough resources, we got one floating here, a couple of cards in his hand. A couple blues here. We might see as many as, you know, four or five attacks this turn. There's a term I use when I'm about to pop off in a game. I say, buckle your ass. We're about to get, <laughs> yeah, it's about to get naughty here. But this is a different story here from last game, Tan and Grays, is because in the last game, Cody whiffed on two Art of Wars off of some Soul Shackles. So the fact that he gets access to at least one more, that is massive here. And that could be the fuel that he needs because he's going to banish uh, a card, which is definitely, technically just playable because it comes out of the banished zone anyways and he's drawing two more so that's more fuel to fuel this turn and this is where he has to get creative this is where he has to do all of the math to make sure that none of this goes to waste you have a, a, a generated go again off of the soul shackle some of the cards will naturally have go again for instance like shadow averser etc but how many turns how many how wide can you go here how how long is this combat chain going to be this is where the best chain players really make their money Right. The first couple turns, yeah, you play some cards, you make some soul shackles, you, you do what you can. Now when the turns get really complicated and they have all of these options to you, you need to squeak out every ounce of advantage, every ounce of damage you can get, especially with the way that Michael Hamilton's been playing this. You've got him at 12. You've got him kind of where you want him. You've got him at a low life total. This is doable if you get this right. You see Cody really taking his time here. I can't blame him. I'm getting excited just listening to this, just watching this, seeing what's going on. I'm very interested to see how he's going to work this out. Yeah, we got, uh, <laughs> we've got we got Ted and Grace doing squats here to just get some of that energy out. He's excited, as am I. And if we look at the previous matchup, Cody versus Michael Hamilton. Cody, when he went on his pop-off turn, uh, you know, when he went to the pop-off turn, Cody did had Michael at 18 and did not have this kind of turn lined up for him. So Cody is in a much better position than he was in the previous game. Michael taking the same strategy, but Cody, I think, seeing that from a mile away, changed up his game plan, and it is looking... The, the landscape is completely different now. All right, Shadow Reverser attacking in here for three. We've got a block here from hand for Michael Hamilton blocking out three, that crippling crush. Not going to be crippling anybody on Cody's side of the board here, but it is going to block out fully from the Shadow Verser. What does Cody have next here? Huge turn lined up. He needs to get at least a few of these cards out of Blood Debt though, because here's the worry here. If he's, if he's at 10, he takes anywhere from like four or five damage. All Michael's do is activate Starvo and the game ends. He's not gonna be able to block anywhere near enough from a dominated attack to be able to do that. The thing is, is Michael gonna have a hand left after this turn? Lots and lots of different things can go on. All right, we've got a belittle here, gonna pump up this next attack. It looks like we've got a bounding Demigon coming from here. So this is going to be plus four, plus five, I think, on the attack here as well. So that is an eight power Demi, Demigon coming in on Michael Hamilton. And, oh, wait, there's going to be more. Oh, it's definitely going to be more. That de bounding Demigon is riding the winds of a minnowism with a little bit of art of war, you know, wind in your sails in that case. So eight is a lot. If Michael Hamilton is holding a D-React, this is where it's going to be played. It's the most value you could possibly hope for here. The, the, the difference in this game versus the last also is the fact that when Cody had the pop-off turn, Michael had a, uh, a full tunic that he was able to cycle seeds for and get an extra card to help mitigate some of that damage. That's not the case this time. Yeah, I don't think there's a D-React in the hand. I think I see Oaken Old and two attacks in his hand. So unless that's a D-React in his uh, arsenal. I see uh, there was a Winter's Grasp in there, an Oaken Old, and... Uh, I think it's an Autumn's Touch. No, that's a Lightning Surge, if I'm oh, not... it's a Lightning Surge. So did he actually... Okay, so he doesn't have Starvo set up because of the Oaken Old in his hand. So it looks like we're going to be just... I do not expect Michael to have a hand left after this turn. Oh, absolutely or, not. No, or no, no. many life points as well. Yeah, this, is, I, this is getting hairy. I don't know if you'll have a, a seat to sit in after this turn is what I'm saying. All right, so that's a six block from hand. Two is going to get through in this Bounding Demigon, but oh, wait, there's more coming. So we've got a huge Bounding Demigon attack coming through here. Two getting done. Let's see, what's the next attack from Cody? Does he have enough go again to keep this turn going wide? He's still got that. I think there's an Invert Existence as well. 
hiding in there? Uh, there is definitely an inverted existence, you know, that's hiding in there as well. But I mean, I think Cody has done this masterfully. He is, he knows that there's no pressure coming his way, so he has kept some of the cards with blood debt just in there, accumulating some damage because he knows that eventually he's going to go off on a turn. He's going to go on a run, and it's and it's basically all the cards for the most part are out of Michael's hand. He's got one more card. It's a lightning surge, a blue lightning surge that he'll ha he could pitch. Excuse me, perhaps for a, th a seeds if necessary. Maybe use some of that floating resource if he does manage to find a uh, staunch response. He could use it then. But um, I think Cody Williams is just thinking right now that he's got uh, he's got a green light to go ham. <laughs> and I've got to wonder if Michael Hamilton ends up losing the game from here. I know that you know games are different every time you play, but I wonder if he's going to think back on the shield choice that he's got here. We've seen Bastion of Eisenloff in this game. We have not seen it come out to block just yet, and I wonder how much damage a ram's head would have blocked through the span of this game, but I understand kind of where he's coming from. He's like, I'm blocking more of the cards from my hand in this game, so I don't have as many resources available to me. That's a very good point, because I believe this is the, the third instance of starting in a combat chain. So that could have been the third instance of ram's head that blocks not for one, not for two, but blocks for three. That ram's head in this, just this turn, would have soaked six damage. So that's one blue from your hand to gain six in this game. That might be enough to win you a game, but... Not to be deterred, there's still a card in hand. There's a card in Arsenal. We've still got Crown of Seeds available to us. We've still got Crater Fist. We've still got that Bastion of Eisenloft. There's still a lot to go on for Michael Hamilton here, but this next attack is going to be really, really big. We've got another Hal from Beyond here. we still got that. we still got this active Art of War that has just been putting in so much work. This is what we were talking about earlier. The Art of War, I think one of the most impactful, if not the most impactful card in this matchup because of the turns like this. You talked about the, the Shackle turns of 5, 6, 7, and 8. These are the ones that are going to get the game's over with. You combine it with this Art of War pumping everything. You see what's going on here. These bounding demigods are attacking for six, seven, and eight every single time. This is so much for Michael to deal with. And then Michael's not going to have a hand when this turns over, so we're just going to go right back to Cody. It's going to happen again. No, Cody's been very, very smart about how he's approaching this. It's no longer a matter of clear out as much of the blood debt, push as much as I can, because Michael is maybe not going to, you know, you know, no, may not soak it all, but what he learned from the last match is he needs to just accumulate it all so that he can explode in one in one foul swoop. So it looks like this lightning surge is going to block a man that only blocks two. This isn't a guardian card, so four damage get through. Michael Hammond down to a precarious six. What does Cody have left this turn? I think that's actually going to be it. It looks like he's going to arsenal up, and half of his life total is going to be taken away by blood debt here. He's down to five. Michael Hamilton is six. Michael Hamilton holding on to that arsenal card here. So keep in mind as well that in this turn, Michael Hamilton took a beating, but he's, he managed to get ahead at the end of the turn, which is fascinating. But look at all the cards that are still in there. There looks to be like there's one more Soul Shackle turn coming. I wish we could have kept track of how much damage Cody kept, did to himself in this game, how much he's self-inflicted, because... I got to say, at least I think half of it has been blood. More than game. half, more than half, I believe, because other than this, I think there was maybe a spinal crush early that was de detrimental. But Michael Hamilton has swung with hammer maybe five or six times this game and connected fully once. Now here's the important thing: Michael Hamilton really, really needs to get through this turn. There's almost no deck left for Cody. He's gonna either die to his own blood debt or he's gonna mill away his own deck. Now, oh no! Oh, there's the eclipse. I don't know if that's gonna happen this turn, but here's here's some more cards. For the fire. Now we've got the Bastion of Eisenloff. We've got a Crater Fist. We've got a Seeds that could be activated here as well. We've got a card in the arsenal. There's four cards in his hand, but you can see the pressure. Look at Michael Hamilton. Look at Cody Williams. They're both dealing with tons and tons of pressure. This is probably the last real turn of the game. Is that a time snap potions in his hand? It's possible. I mean, that can give you a little bit of extra juice. Time Snap Potion was pitched a lot earlier in the game. We do know that he's running two in the list. Right now, Michael Hamilton basically built a parachute out of duct tape, and he's hoping that he can land safely. That's what he's hoping for here. It is just a scary situation because he knows what's coming down the pipe. He sees that the ground is coming at him at a really high pace. Now, the really important stuff here I want to talk about, look what's in this banish zone. We've got a Howl from Beyond. I think that's two invert existence. Is that two Hal from Beyond's actually? So we got two and two of each one of those. Huge ways to push through a lot of extra damage. You got this, this invert existence which also can push through some damage as a Shadow Rune Blade instant. So we don't really need action points for that as well. So the big test for Cody here is can he push through enough damage to either kill Michael the old-fashioned way here, the way the chain normally does it, or 
Can he possibly finish off this turn with inverting systems? Let's count up all the demons that we see here. We've got the Bastion of Izalov can block two, right? We've got two from Crater Fist. That's four. We're up to five on the Crown Seas. We're up to six as well up with that Tunic. And we've got four cards in hand at the All Black for three. That's 12, so that's 18 total, possibly, that we can block with Michael Hamilton this turn. And you've got to believe that every single one of these cards is going to do it. Don't forget, another card could possibly be added to hand here. We've got that third counter on the Tunic that can add the fifth card to Michael Hamilton. So, so possibly being able to block upwards of 20 damage this turn. Right, and on uh, and if there is a broken chain, you will be able to get a second swing in with the uh, the stalagmite as well as the other crater fist. So you could go up to 22 plus damage in terms of blocking here, but I think that Cody could easily just punch right through that. His Cody right now is biggest biggest enemy is himself. Yeah, I mean, his biggest threat is that blood debt that's piling up, and the cards that he's pitched in the order he's done so has now come back to haunt him. He's basically reaping what he sowed, frankly, and he's seeing that this could either be feast or famine for him, and he's hoping that he can be the one at the end of the day to still have life points. Got to give a shout out to our other caster that's not in here right now. Brian Gottlieb made sure that we got this match specifically on camera in the top eight in the first round, and I got to say, Brian... Well done, well picked. This one has been a good one. One of the most tense matches I've ever seen in Flesh and Blood. It's coming down to this captain's call is going to be the start of the turn here. It looks like it's going to be a plus two, so no go again added from there. We've got Chain going up to the ninth shackle. That's not really going to matter. The go again is what's going to matter. That time that potion is going to get pitched. Three resources here. Now we've got a ghostly visit. Attacking from Banish here. All right, that's a good start. That is going to be a pretty hefty one as well, as that's coming in, if I'm not mistaken, for... Uh, I believe that's coming in for uh, six, if I'm not mistaken. Here we go. Yep, it is, in fact, six. All right, so the dice don't lie, Tan and Grace. That is a six-point attack with a ghostly visit. So here comes the that creative accounting now. We're going to go ahead and use the tunic value to go ahead and drop a card from Arsenal under the deck, and hopefully, hopefully this could be something like a staunch response. Yeah, pretty important to mention here, uh, you can't get greedy with your seeds here. You just need the fifth card in your hand as early as possible to have all of the information, just because you need to know what's going on this turn, how much you could block from where. And you're going to be blocking with that tunic as well the first time that it gets a really good block in. All right, so I did see a guardian attack, two guardian attacks. I believe there's like a, uh, is that a disable, if I'm not mistaken? I might have seen an Okadol. That looks like disable. There's disable. I there's see a Channel Lake Frigid. Yeah, so those are three, three blocks in there. So disable is uh, one of the options here, blocking for three, which is good. So it looks like, okay, so yeah, Frostbite given over to Cody Williams. That's not... That is very, very relevant here. That's not anything to, to forget about. There is a Frostbite here, so that's going to sew up a resource. A little bit of damage getting through. Cody looking... No, no, no damage because... Okay, the sorry seed, about yeah. that. No, it's all good. The seed says seeds is going to soak the last one. one. Right, prevent one, three, and two. I thought we got one through here. Cody's sitting up in his chair. Looks like he's maybe got on his mind what he's got to, get, got to do here. He's still got a tall order in front of him. That's a lot of cards left over Michael Hammond's hand. That's a lot of equipment. We see Michael play this game so close. I believe right on the razor's edge. I believe there's eight damage left uh, of, of block in Michael's hand. There's a oak and old. There is a channel lake frigid. I believe is what you said that you saw, and I think a winter's grasp. I could be wrong on one of them. There's at least an oak and old. We did see that, and uh, so it's potentially eight block that's uh, available to him. I may have just seen a blizzard. Oh well, that is a whole different uh, rhubarb pie, if you will. I'm going to stop taking guesses of what's in his hand, though. We'll see along with the people at home of when it happens. But if that is a blizzard, that could be game-breaking. That's just a whole different ball game. You're absolutely right. Forcing your opponent to pay two just to maintain go again. If that resource is, is critical to keeping this going, that could be, that could, like you said, game-breaking indeed. And that's the important part is the resource count, right? Cody just put another card in for resources. He's got one floating here, but this is a howl from beyond. This is going to pump the next attack. This is getting so tense. Flake. I can feel it all the way in the booth here on the other side of the room, away from the players. You can see they're both setting up, running their hands through their hair, hands on their forehead. Just Is that an Earth card? It might be an Earth card. So I see a Winter's Grasp, if I'm not mistaken, and Oak and Olden. Is that Earth? I mean, we're, we're all over the place here trying to guess it. He I is think it's a Channel Lake Frigid. Uh, uh, maybe a winter's grass. I'm not sure. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll give up on that part. We'll just try to call this game 
This turn, so complicated. It is indeed complicated, and like it, it's a whole different ball game when all the pieces are right in front of you. Michael Hamilton knows the potential of, of of what can come his way, and this is where when you're playing against Chain, it helps to also be a Chain player to know what exactly the reach is. Now this is important here. Another Hal from Beyond is getting played. That Chain, sorry, that Combat Chain, has been broken here. So Stalagmite going to get in another damage. So that was three that it's going to end up probably blocking here this turn. Also, another Frostbite on block here. This could be huge and game-breaking. We've seen Michael play so carefully with the shield the entire game, and it's probably going to come down to this, and I think it might be the impact that gets him through this turn. We'll have to see, but taking two resources away from Cody this turn might be enough. Yeah, if Cody was holding on to some blues, obviously you want to be paying for that, but ultimately if that is, uh, if that's, that, 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 that's the lagmite. Being able to be played twice in this turn creates a situation where you are paying two extra. That is a whole other card out of your hand in order to just continue to fuel this turn. And Cody has been playing that dangerous game of absorbing blood debt for so long that if he cannot clear that out, he might not have another turn. Looks All right. like we're going to block from hand finally, so we're down to three cards. Right now this looks like a block for six, but with a frostbite. Frostbite is huge in this matchup. Again, costing resources out of Cody's hand is going to be massive here. Yep. So it looks like we got a block for six lined up here. Keep in mind also that the Crown of Seeds has already been used, and if, if Co Cody could potentially, if things line up right, just swing with Rosetta and poke in with the two damage that it might be unblockable. Still got those invert existences as well. Can do a very good impression of that. All right, it looks like we're going to be committing to this block for six. This game had, would have gone to time, and we're at 55-plus minutes here. You can see just how important it is to make sure that you are you are on the level, that every little aspect, every detail is accounted for. There's the Frostbite, a little donation from uh, the uh, from the, the Stalagmite charity. Here, you can take this with you. Uh, now, this is kind of important again as well. This combat chain gets broken yet again. We're going to have that armor come back out. That Crater Fist is going to be able to block again this turn and gain another life, just showing... How close Michael's played this, how well he's played this for this exact turn. He's like, I just need to weather the other turns, and then on the turn like this. Because let's be honest, most turns like this from a chain player, you're not surviving from. And Michael is doing a very good job of navigating this. Yeah, like we mentioned, like the, the last two minutes of a basketball game take 30 minutes. That's what this is. It's the most crucial part of the game when all the chips are on the table and you have to make sure that these pieces fit together to make a pretty picture. And that's what Cody's trying to do here. Looks like double invert existence possibly happening here. All right, so the pitch if was... If you double uh, the invert in existence, doesn't that just make it a normal existence? I'm not good with a... Uh, I'm pretty uh, positive. If you invert in something I, and invert again, it's back to where it's like it's like doing a 360. I'm not an existenceologist, so <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not an existence scientist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get some uh, scienticians in here uh, to figure that one out. Uh, it's way above my pay grade. All right. I mean, uh, what we do know right now is that Michael Hamilton's at four, and uh, the, it's... Uh, the, the train keeps chugging along here, but again, like you mentioned, those frostbites may have become very important here. This activates Eclipse. Oh, just Eclipse. Yeah, no big deal. So there it is. Eclipse is a free instant that if you have played six or more cards with Blood Debt this turn, if you have, you may play Eclipse from your Banished Zone, which was there. So create an Urser, the Soul Reaper token. This was a factor in the, la in the last game that Michael won. Michael actually managed to absorb the Urser and then kill it on the next turn and just make hay here. But there it is, a beautiful piece. The Urser, the Soul Reaper, has entered the fray. This is a rune chant attached with, with Urser as well. So this is an instance of one attacking for six. Does Michael have what it takes to get through this? I think this is the last gasp from Cody. So there is still the the head. There, you have the, the gloves. You do have the tunic if necessary. And I believe he's holding an Okanol to block here. Or there's another three block, I believe. No, he's got two cards in hand. So there's still some options here. Three cards in hand. Is there possibly there's a three card hand? Michael Hamilton is really just kind of doing the math here. Cody, look at him. Cody's just showing, I got nothing in hand here. This is what you see. What you see is what you get, my friend, and it is this Urser, the Soul Reaper. Okay, it looks like maybe this Rune Chant is, an, is not actually popping with this Urser here. Maybe it's a timing with the, the, the way that they resolve. It's, it's very complicated, the turns with Chain like this. Making sure you get through this completely correct. 
you need a judge almost every time to get through these turns correctly. And there they are. I mean, this is the calling Tan and Grace. This is the t the highest level of flesh and blood that we have ever played as the calling. I mean, we do have the Nationals. These are on the same tier in terms of the, the quality of the players. Cody Williams on chain coming out of seemingly nowhere. The chain players are really learning something about that. The fact that this is still a hero that you need to worry about. That uh, under the right, you know, under the right uh, uh, piloting can really make waves here. Absolutely, really making waves here, making a name for himself. Cody Williams definitely has had some really good showings in the past, put up some great results, but looking to improve on that and take home one of those trophies. I can tell you right now, every player really wants to win, not just because of the prizes that are involved, but the prestige that comes along of calling yourself a champion of any kind of big event, calling, national championship, pro tour that we've got coming up. But that's how you start to submit yourself in this game as a legend, as one of the big players, as one of the big names. Players yeah. like Matt Rodgers that we have in this top eight and that I just got a report. Unfortunately, his run for the day has come to an end. Matt Rodgers falls to our number one seed, Fano Black, doing what he's been doing all day long, piloting Prism through this Bravo thick field and doing it well. Well, Fano has been really, really you know, it has been on a tear, frankly. You know, one of the one of the last standing undefeated players throughout this tournament before ultimately falling, but... Uh, Our it, number one seed by a full win as well. Easy. Why not, Fino? Congratulations for that. And, uh, you know, Matt Rogers, again, has, has been out there saying that the, the field has improved and has succumbed to that field. Top eight's still a pretty good finish, though. Not going to lie. Uh, it's pretty damn good. And you know what else is pretty damn good? Matt Rogers. Well... <laughs> I was going to say, I was seeing Urser on the board here, no problem. I mean, how often do you get to see that? I mean, we've seen it twice today, but Urser the Soul Reaper is a token that, again, attack for zero. It's fine, no problem. Just go in with a fresh six. So, the, like, the real problem here is if Michael blocks with all the cards from his hand, he's not going to be able to attack Urser, right? No, correct. And that means that Urser is just going to have another swing next game, uh, next turn, rather. But, uh, again, Soul, you're going to be banishing cards off the top. But you're going to be drying those up anyways, but then the pitch recycles. It's it's a little bit of creative math in terms of how this goes, but ultimately this is it. I mean, look what Cody's done in order to just clear out that whole blood debt vault of cards. And and Michael has done a, a, a spectacular, a spectacular job of just absorbing it and staying relevant and keeping this game uh, continue to go. So it looks like Michael's finally come to the decision of how he's going to get through this turn. It looks like he's lining up a block. We talked about the being able to block multiple times in a turn of the equipment. Here it is finally coming up a second time this turn. This Crater Fist probably going to get to block three hole damage this turn. Bastion of Eisenloff blocked three hole damage this turn, took away two resources. Imagine if we didn't have this on Michael's side. These fully done up equipment that could block multiple times this turn. I don't know if he makes it through this without having the equipment suite, which he had multiple opportunities to get good blocks of these earlier in the games, and you're seeing why he passed up on those. He wanted to set up this kind of effect. I mean, ultimately, if Michael could just hold on, again, snake eating its tail, Cody's just going to succumb to his own blood debt that has been left there by that carry-on husk, that carry-on husk that's just going to haunt him every turn, and now Cody's on a clock himself. It's two blood that he, uh, two blood debt that he's eaten, as there's still one card with blood debt that he has left on the menu. Now I don't know if that's yeah. I was gonna say he's gonna draw these four cards. The rest of his deck is gone. It's gonna be gone at the beginning of the next turn. Michael has a card left over in his hand. This is what took so long. He wanted to make sure they had a card left over in his hand. He's gonna be able to pitch this. I, I believe he's gonna be able to pitch this. Oh, this looks like this might be an arsenal. This is an arsenal. Okay, this is an opening for Cody. The Urser is going to survive. Draw four here for Michael. So he's got four cards in his hand. There's only one counter of the Spring Tunic, so no free seeds this turn. That's going to take a card from his hand if he wants to do that. I think I just saw a defensive reaction get drawn, though. I think that is a staunch defense. That is a big draw for Michael Hamilton. Does Cody have what he needs to get through this turn? The this game is so intense. It is definitely intense, and the problem here is the fact that if you want to block seven, you got to pitch a card away, and that gives an opening for another attack to be able to punch through. But I think that Michael at four is at a relatively safe you know, area. Again, it's very dangerous to say, especially when you're staring down an Urser like that. That is a dangerous piece. Now, almost all the equipment is gone, right? We do have one more free block from equipment. Don't forget... Spring Tunic really likes to be the last one in there to jump. And it's like, I got this, boss. I can get that. I can get that one. I got one for you, and that's it. 
it's kind of like the tap-in goal, you know? It's just, all right, no problem. You do all the work, I'll just clean up the garbage. But that's what it's there for. Uh, I, you know, I don't suspect that we'll see a Tunic uh, get up to three again. I think that this game is going to end before that. So the Tunic is most likely going to get fed to the Wolves here in this turn, just so Michael Hamil could, Hamilton could stay alive. But again, the fact that you have a free six attack, that is a great thing for Cody to rely on to actually pressure. So another Soul Shackle, which means absolutely butt kiss here because it's just going to come through for another free go again. Yeah, making sure we get go again on this Urser. You got to make sure your Urser gets go again. That's a common play line that we see all the time in callings. I mean, I've seen this. I, I, did, I did it before breakfast this morning. I woke up, did my stretches, took a shower, gave Urser go again, came to the calling. That's basically how he goes. All right, so we've got a prevention shield set up here. One resource floating. That's important as well. If there's any kind of arcane damage coming through these null rune boots or there. Um, is this rune chant still in play from last turn? Because this hasn't been popped on any of the attacks. I, I, I mean, a token attack, I don't know if that if factors in for the rune chant. Again, these are such... Um, right. un, I don't want to say unorthodox, but uncommon board states, right? How often do you see an orser, like you mentioned? So seeing how this kind of eventually develops is fascinating just from from a perspective that it's unique. So another pitch card here happens. What that's going to do is make staunch response be able to block. Now, look, there we go. The resource floating is going to prevent the rune chant. The bounding demigon is going to be coming in. So that's a bounding demigon. I believe that's a, is that a blue bounding demigon? Yeah, it's pumped up just a little bit. So we got a block from hand. Honestly, that's going to fully block. One card left in Michael's hand. What does Cody have left? It looks like three or four full cards. Is he going to be able to get this done? It's possible. I think it's three full cards in his hand. I think I see a Vexing... I think I see a Belittle? Yeah, there are some cards in there. I mean, or a Minnowism, maybe? The Minnowisms were pitched very early in the game, don't forget. So they have come back. In the first couple turns, we did see a back-to-back -back Minnowism pitch, and this might come back to haunt him, but it can also buff an attack. This foiling resource is very important here, too. Those Nolgrim boots are looming large. That last two can't be got in from Arcane from the Rosetta Thorn. Cody trying to figure out exactly how is he going to play this for those last couple of points. Michael, I mean... He's got one resource floating, one card in his hand. He's right there, Cody. One block from the spring tunic. So if you block from hand, that's three. Save one that's from uh, from the resource, that's one. One from spring tunic, that's five. You got to get in nine with these last couple cards. I don't know if he's going to be able to do it. So he's just evaluating what's going on over here again. He, he does. He, he's running out of runway, like you mentioned. You gotta get. You, you gotta gain some altitude here, otherwise you're just falling off the cliff. So Cody, hopefully here is looking. At, that is a minnowism again. We mentioned earlier that it did get pitched a blue and a red back to back, and that might be what's in the, the hand over here. But keep in mind, a minnowism is one good way to buff up one of the attacks that are coming through. I think I saw a Shrill of Skull form in his hand as well. If he can get that one to attack, that can be a pretty big powered attack here, though. It matters if it's a blue one. I think they're only blue. Well, he does have some yellow ones in his deck, it looks like, as well. So those attacks can come in for a lot. It would be a little less than seven. It would probably be more like six or five, but that's but a lot of damage. What needs to be also understood here is the fact that that Time Snap Potion, which was pitched, is what essentially you're drawing into, and that is not a threat. That is just juice in terms of getting the, the engines churning here to, to maybe get some attacks, but you're running out of attacks. Yeah, this, this is the last turn for Cody. If he doesn't get it done here, I, I don't think there's any kind of pitch stack that he can make that actually is going to threaten a full hand from Michael next turn, or Michael just might be able to kill him with the cards that he has in his hand. These are always some of the most stressful times, not just as the chain player, but as the person receiving it. It's it, stressful to hear for me and you, too. Like, I, don't, I don't know if you're feeling it. I'm feeling the stress. I can't even sit down. <laughs> <laughs> it's but like if you look at Michael Hamilton, he has basically been a passenger on this turn. He's been presenting the proper lines of defense here, but he is just observing. So there's another pitch of the Minnowism, and again, none of these cards are ever going to get banished again because they're just going to get drawn up before the banish occurs. That is it. That's all she wrote in terms of what cards are there. All right, there it is. You are spot on for the uh, Shrill of Skull form. I do believe that is a blue though, Flake. So this is only going to be attacking for five. And we needed to present a little bit more in this, but we do still have Rosetta Thorn behind us. So this is five. There's four more. That's nine. Michael Hamilton deep in the tank here. Uh, he, this might be the most stressful game he's ever been a part of. 
I mean, and he just came off of a game where it was another stressful one against Cody earlier. So he knows this feeling. He's lived in it. He's, he, he's you know, it's like I he was born in it. He was molded by it, right? So he's just exactly knows how to deal with it. Uh, the composure is there, but the focus is also there. And that's what you always have to hold on to in these situations. Don't get rattled. Don't get tilted. Stay focused. No one cared who he was until he put on the crown of seeds. <laughs> Boo. Right, boo, sorry. but boo, but yay. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to. So it does look like some damage is going to get through here on that block for three. Michael down to three. I was going to say, are there any cards left in his hand? There's one resource floating. It does look like that's going to be it and for the turn. And unfortunately, again, uh, there is the blood that that came through. That Urser, though, still looming large. There's no cards left in Michael Hamilton's. All right, so all he's going to do is put up that tunic and uh, just say, all right, have at it again. I might have said it just a little bit too early. Cody Williams down to one. He is going to get another turn. I kind of forgot the fact that this Urser is going to sit around, and that's important. There's so much going on on every single turn from this chain player. Well, if, if he could – okay, so he still has the belittle, right? So that's a non-attack action. Uh, it's a minimalism. It's a minimalism, sorry. It's going to buff up the shadow of Urser if necessary. I think the last bastion of hope here is the fact that you can go in with the minimalism onto the shadow of Urser with the soul shackle that uh, basically gives it go again. That'll buff it up. Yep, there's the minimalism. Uh, is that, I believe that's the blue. The time snap potion's in the hand as well. That's basically complete junk. He's holding onto rags here other than the fact that that minimalism is going to buff up a pretty punchless shadow of Urser. So minimalism first. Hit. We're going to go ahead and create the go again. Pitch. It's, oh, Vexing Malice Red. That's the other card. That's a big one. Yeah, this is the card that's left over. This is going to do arcane damage and physical damage. So two arcane coming at Michael right now, plus an attack for four. Breakpoints, baby. Breakpoints. This is where you're going to see that tunic just be thrown into the fire. There's still an Urser here as well. Don't forget, he's still going to deal with six. That's a sink below. There's a sink below in Michael Hamilton's hand, if I'm not mistaken. There it is. That's a nice clean block if necessary. All right, so this is, a, this is an instance of two, though. So one damage is going to get through. So one damage prevented. Two resources floating. Michael Hamilton down to two. Does Cody have what it takes to get through this? Is he going to be able to survive this Vexing Mouse? He does have a free block here for four. And then I think I see a block for six behind this. Or wait, Channel Lake for Virgin is only two, but that's a block for five. Uh, Channel Lake for Virgin is a three. That's going to block three? for the Absolutely, he's going to block for three. And there's another Guardian attack, so he's got six blocks phys physical in the hand. But right now, what Cody's thinking is like, I got one more. I got one more shot here. I have no more go again. So this is where it all comes down, I believe, as he's thinking. Okay, well, might as well go for the big boy. Let's uh, let's hope that you don't have it. Let's hope that you've got two two blocks in your hand, but it doesn't matter. Just in case. There it is. Fist bump. What a game. Cody Williams is unfortunately not finishing. Get past the finish line. Michael Hamilton holds on for deal life. Wow. All I can say is wow. One of the most intense games I've ever seen. I've just sat down for the first time in the last <laughs> 20 minutes. I could not contain myself. During that game, yet another shout out. I think needs to go to Brian Gottlieb for picking this game. Uh, absolute masterful game from both players here. One of the most intense games I've ever seen. Do I need to shower? I just want to like, just, just, yeah, just get a little spritz. But yeah, what what a game from both players. Cody, you can definitely hang your hat on this one as one of the better games I've ever seen in Flesh and Blood. Unfortunately, your tournament is going to come to an end here. Michael Hamilton is going to move on to those semifinals. He better ask a judge for a little bit of a break after this. I would imagine. I mean, that one went the distance for sure. Cody Williams, though, major, major props to you for that one because he knew what was coming up. Michael Hamilton was his opponent not two games ago or so and knew that there was the defensive strategy coming in, the fatigue strategy. What Cody Williams did was decided, like, I, if I'm not going to be atta getting attacked, I can afford to take some blood debt. I'm going to create this bank of attacks so that when I feel comfortable, we're going to go full force. And he got a little closer this time but not close enough. And you know what? Props on him for building his deck in a way that definitely could compete with that was going on. He got so close. We actually saw an Urser token, you know, things you don't normally see too much in the chain matches anymore without Seeds of Agony. But what a hell of a match. What a hell of a finish. And we got one hell of a top four as well. So I think we can take a look at this bracket and what's left over. That Michael Hamilton, you know what? He's going to be playing against Sam Dando. I can't wait to watch this match myself. Briar, uh, one of my absolute favorite heroes going up against this. And on the left side, we've got Fino Black, that prism, that number one seed playing against David Rude, the Bravo star of the show. Fino has been carving his way through the Bravo star of the shows all day, all tournament long. But is he going to be able to do it one more time? 
when he has to go through d -Rude. So we're going to find out here in just a few minutes. Flake, I know you need a minute. I need a minute. The players, at least uh, Michael Hamilton's definitely going to need a little bit of a break. So we're going to take a very short one, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Flesh and Blood.